going our side chatters drinking a little drink smoking a little smoke i'm greg carlwood just trying to enjoy the goddamn day here in san diego it's just craziness out there this comic-con madness i do love it but it is a little embarrassing that we'll flood the streets for batman vs superman but not the hundreds of issues that are causing death and destruction all over the planet but whoa that's a little bit heavy to start for what will be the final thc that does not have a plus extension, and honestly, I was going to take the time off to fix the issues that I'm having from the website and have some fun at the Comic-Con and not have a show this week, but I got Adam Gorightly's new book in the mail, Historia Discordia, which talks about the origins of the Discordian society back in the day, and he's an awesome guy, and I've been really interested in Robert Anton Wilson lately, who's a big part of the Discordianism saga. So we put a show together, and I ended up really loving it, because we talk about so many great illuminated tricksters of the 60s on up. Wilson, of course, Timothy Leary, Terrence McKenna, George Carlin, Alan Watts, Hunter S. Thompson, just a bunch of my favorite people and the way they affected society often in the same types of ways and it's a good one and then next week we're launching plus which is where every episode will have an extra hour with the guest that is for people willing to subscribe for the low low price of five dollars a month signups are a little better but not good enough that i'm not concerned about september's rent some of you have voiced concerns that you don't like paypal or bitcoin i get that i am working on a solution for you guys Others are upset that they can't get it off iTunes, and I think those people haven't been to the new site yet. Remember, it's the thehiresidechatsplus.com. It's real easy to type that in to a browser and stream there. It's going to be super convenient to listen to from a computer or a smartphone. It can be streamed or downloaded. And even still, I am working on an RSS feed solution, but for a secure feed it's a little tougher and i'm getting closer every day i really just have one last technical glitch to solve and then it should be available also when you become a subscriber to plus there's a place to suggest guests and topics honestly i get a lot of suggestions from reddit twitter facebook email everything and it's hard to manage them and there's no way i can get to all of them but that's got to be the list that i look at first so make sure you put something down when you sign up I also had some difficulty playing phone tag with the other Money Bomb winner. It's actually a couple. I think I said Julie on the last show, and her name was on the PayPal account, but her husband called and left a message on the voicemail app on the site. So I think I'm going to play that, and then I'm going to play a little one-and-a-half-minute clip from Robert Anton Wilson about language and how it affects the mind. An unusual thing for me to do, but I think it's important because if everyone has a small sense of at least one of these main guys we're talking about today, it'll make the whole show better. And then we're going to get serious about the great spoof religion of Discordianism on the other side. Hail Eris. Hey, Greg, it's Brandon, the grateful recipient of the recent Money Bomb. Just uh, calling in to let you know I live and work on the east side of Cleveland. I'm a professional loafer at Amy Joy Donuts. My favorite topics for the show, and, and by the way, the show is phenomenal, man. Don't change a thing. I love the plus idea. We already signed up. That was, you know, thanks to the Money Bomb. But my favorite topics, you know, by far is Hollow Earth. I'm a big fan, always been a big proponent of that. But I have not run across a show I haven't loved. Uh, maybe future shows, the RH Negative Blood Mystery is just uh, it's something I've just scratched the surface of, and it's really hard to find anything that's really, you know, really goes all the way into depth and explains why that is, you know. Are they predecessors to the positive blood type or the other way around? Just so the people know, also, the money will be used to ensure that there is a little drink and a little smoke to enjoy the future episodes. Obviously, we've signed up for Plus already, and... Uh, I'll be buying a tarot deck and some new tires for my bike, and uh, my wife is going to get some art, much-needed art supplies. Keep hope alive and keep up the great work, man. Thanks again. Oh, 
We're trapped in linguistic con constructs. All that is is metaphor. I believe somebody said that before me. I've decided we can't get beyond words. What we got to do is get more cynical about our words. You'll find that by dispensing with is and trying to reformulate without is, you just naturally fall into the kind of expression which is considered acceptable in modern science. And also, it's the type of consciousness that uh, Zen Buddhism tries to induce. Using E prime, you will understand modern science and Zen Buddhism both a lot better than you've ever understood them before. Martin Gardner has written a long essay proving that to think like this will destroy your mind. I, I, think, it, I think it adds tremendously to clarity. I am removing the is from my writing more and more. Removing it from your speech is even harder. Instead of thinking the grass is green, or to think the grass appears green to me, and this saves me a lot of time, uh, by the way. I don't get embroiled in arguments like Beethoven is better than Mozart, or rock is better than soul. I define such things as meaningless. And so people get into arguments like that. I just say, well, Beethoven seems better to me than Mozart most of the time. But I don't say Beethoven is better than Mozart. People would, by and large, act a hell of a lot more sanely, especially if they, you know, when they got rid of is, they dropped, they put maybe in more sentences. I think if everybody used maybe more often, the, the increase in general sanity would be absolutely, it would, it would seem absolutely astonishing and completely flabbergasted everybody. What the hell is we suddenly got a planet full of sane people? When did that start to happen? I didn't even notice it. You just listen to the craziest people on the news and on television, or the craziest columnists in the newspapers, you know, they never say maybe, they're always quite sure, and they always know is, and they never say seems, they always say is. People start arguing about words, and they're mostly arguing about whether the words that they apply to the objects they have created out of the infinity of uh, possible objects that could be put together, they've picked up a few of them, and they put words on them, and they quarrel about the words. And if, uh, if these people get to the stage where they're willing to kill one another over the words, they should be put in a nice quiet home in the country with kindly doctors and beautiful nurses and good sedatives. But generally they end up in government mansions and start bombing one another. Or they lead religious crusades for the true faith and kill one another with swords or some such thing. Folks, as we meander through this life without a proper set of instructions, those who feel compelled to seek enlightenment will often try on many different hats and entertain many methodologies for years before finding one that best speaks to them and finally makes those universal truths click. Whether it be modern incarnations of secret societies and initiatory orders, the study of the Kabbalah, meditation, occult magic, or Zen Buddhism, the goal is generally the same. Discovering the underlying truths to the universe and reality, the betterment of oneself, and a clearer understanding of life. Well, today we're going to dive into one of these lesser-known schools of thought, or lack thereof, called the Discordian Society with Adam Gorightly, a man who most of you will be pretty familiar with by now and is one of Discordianism's biggest proponents in modern times, although they probably know him better by his Pope name, the wrong Reverend Houdini Kundalini of the Church of Unwavering Indifference. <laughs> but Adam has not only written about the major players in its early days, he's also been busy archiving many Discordian writings, notes, and artifacts in true crackpot historian fashion. For his new book, Historia Discordia, The Origins of the Discordian Society, and the vast online archives that can be found at historiadiscordia.com. You know him, you love him, you can't live without him. Adam, go rightly, my man, how the hell are you? Great, Greg. How's it going, now? <laughs> it just keeps getting better every day. <laughs> Well, this is something special, man. You've co-hosted a lot of shows with me over the last however long, written some blogs too, which has been awesome. Thank you for that. And we've definitely name-dropped Discordianism along the way, and your book comes right at a perfect time for me, man, because I'm just getting... Because just in the past three or four months, I've been listening to a ton of Robert Anton Wilson lectures, and knowing that he was involved in Discordianism and seeing so many of his personal writings and letters scanned into this new book of yours... It's been a real treat, man, and a bit of a synchronicity. Yeah, indeed, indeed. The interview comes at a good time. So to get the ball rolling here, man, tell the people about the Discordianism origin story. How did this all unfold? 
Is it all just blood sacrifices and ritual invocations as we'd expect? Uh, not exactly. Uh, started in a uh, Southern California bowling alley in 1958, I believe. Uh, there's uh, some disagreement about the exact date, but I think 58 is a pretty solid date when uh, Kerry Thornley and Greg Hill, a couple of uh, teenagers that lived there in the Orange County town of uh, Whittier, California, a couple of odd kids, uh, <laughs> free-thinking nerds, one of the guys I interviewed described them as, and uh, they were uh, into having long-winded discussions about uh, politics and philosophy and religion and all this, so they'd spent a lot of time doing this in bowling alleys. They were able to buy beer is the reason they uh, would go to bowling alleys and stay there for long hours uh, discussing all this stuff. And one of the times, one of the discussions got into uh, order and chaos in the universe, you know, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. where this came from, where all the chaos uh, came from. And uh, they threw around different ideas, uh, basically, that there really was, their thinking was there really was no order in the universe that's human perception laid over <laughs> what is uh, truly what was in their mind is a chaotic uh, universe. And so, you know, they were uh, kicking around these ideas and they go, well, what we need is a religion dedicated to chaos. You have all these religions with all these deities that are here to bring order to the earth. We need one uh, that represents chaos. And Greg Hill said, well, there already is one in Greek mythology, and that's uh, Discordia, or Eris, the Greek goddess of chaos and confusion. And so that's when it basically started, <laughs> that little seed of an idea, as a quote-unquote spoof religion <laughs> uh, back there in the uh, late 50s. They also, also claimed that they had a vision at that time where uh, Eris appeared to them in the uh, bowling alley. <laughs> Appropriate. <laughs> and, yeah. And so that started the Discordian Society and was just kind of an in-joke between uh, Kerry Thornley, Greg Hill, and a few other of their friends back then. And they uh, didn't really do much with it um, you know, in 59, which was like a year later. Thornley uh, enlisted in the Marines where he met uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. We've <laughs> kind of been through this story before, mm -hmm. but so... The next uh, two or three years, he was in the Marines, and then when he got out, he ended up back in Southern California, met up again with Greg Hill, and uh, they wanted, they were looking for some excitement in their life. Formerly was a, a budding writer, so they decided to go to the, uh, move to the French Quarter in New Orleans, and that's when the uh, Discordian activities uh, ramped up. That was like in the early 60s, and... Uh, Within the next few years, they uh, came up with the first edition of the Principia Discordia or Principia Discordia, however you want to pronounce it. And that was in 1965. And the book Bible itself continued to evolve over the years, as did uh, Greg Hill and Kerry Thornley. So that's kind of the origin, how the whole thing uh, started. Right on. And yeah, it, it's an interesting story. And it's funny because I just have always kind of, with the with only knowing vaguely about Discordianism, I just thought it was a big joke. And I think that it, they're happy to let people think that it's a joke, which is totally fine. <laughs> but also, I just think there really is some insight to the underlying philosophy hidden beneath all those layers of humor and jokes and pranks. I think that there is some insight there that's valuable. Would you say that? Well, yeah. And part of the... Uh I think a lot of the motivation that inspired Discordianism and as a quote unquote spoof religion was able, you know, basically as a vehicle, way to alter consciousness as a way to put it or to break those molds yeah. and uh, try something new and different and kind of maybe enlighten other people along the way just to get them questioning uh, organized religion and everything else that. Uh, <laughs> We consider consensus reality. It got going during the heyday of the uh, counterculture. So it was uh, the type of religion, people who were into psychedelics and trying new things. It was uh, something interesting to uh, play with. Once again, to use as a uh, 
vehicle, perhaps, to poke fun at not only organized religions, but also, you know, a lot of the hypocrisy and paganism and the counterculture. So, yeah, in a way, it was, uh, you know, much like uh, comedians use their uh, craft to uh, poke holes in uh, whatever is in popular culture at any given time. That's kind of where Discordianism was uh, coming from, in a sense. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. And uh, it's funny because Robert Anton Wilson, I found out, actually did put out a comedy album. And uh, one of the lines from it is used in, a, in one of Carlin's specials. And Carlin actually has been quoted in saying that he's never learned more from any one source in his life than Robert Anton Wilson, which I think is a reason to pay attention if you find any <laughs> value in the insights of Carlin. I mean, that's that's a huge huge endorsement from someone that I've always had a high regard for. Yeah. Well, they knew each other and, uh, they both came, uh, from the same time and place. Uh, like they both grew up in the uh, Bronx in New York, uh, New York during, you know, the same period, whenever that was the, uh, 1930s or forties. Yeah. And so, yeah, they, <laughs> and they grew up, uh, in, uh, Catholicism and all the uh, basic uh, confines that that put on a youth trying to grow up. So they rebelled against that, you know, in their their own ways. Yeah, I mean, they're both now two of my biggest idols in terms of insight and articulating higher perspectives. But I did want to read this little piece from Robert Anton Wilson that you have in the introduction where he kind of describes the aspect of Discordianism that we're talking about. He says, it'll be understood by the Kabbalistic reader that Discordianism is a system of transcendental atheism, agnostic Gnosticism, skeptical monotheism, and unified dualism. In short, the Arisian revelation is not a complicated put-on disguised as a new religion, but a new religion disguised as a complicated (laughs) put-on. Which is a pretty great way to describe it, wouldn't you say, man? Yeah, and uh, Wilson was a big fan of trying on different hats, you know, as far as... uh looking into alternative religions and but basically uh, what came out of that was that you shouldn't uh, just confine yourself to one hat but to uh, continue to uh, question and grow and look at different things and not get stuck in one reality tunnel was the uh, phrase that he liked to use so much yeah man i mean the more perspectives you can have the better obviously but it's just funny that people think of it as such a joke, and I ironically lately have been thinking about it more seriously because if you're familiar with like Alan Watts, who talks a lot about the methodology of Zen Buddhism and the way that these spiritual gurus use elaborate techniques to exhaust their subjects and run them around in circles until it finally hits them that they had enlightenment the whole time and they realize it's not some gift you can just get from a wise man. I mean, mm-hmm. do you see similarities in the way Discordianism kind of a- approaches initiates? It's interesting you should bring up uh, Alan Watts because I'd never really uh, – I knew that Greg Hill and Carrie Thornley were influenced by a lot of counterculture figures, but I never uh, equated uh, Alan Watts with uh, Discordianism. But I was interviewed uh, by a guy, uh, Nick of Cult, uh, the uh, Cult of Nick podcast. Yeah. He ha- does that out of Britain. He brought up – he was talking about the uh, – Holy Trinity of Discordianism. Of course, he mentioned uh, Kerry Thornley and Robert Anton Wilson, and he brought up Alan Watts, and I go, hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Alan Watts wasn't really involved in Discordianism, but he picked up on a lot of that uh, mindset or philosophy with Alan Watts, too, that related to uh, Discordianism. And that's the whole thing about uh, Discordianism. You know, there's uh, no rules. You don't Uh, need to jump through any particular hoops to uh, define yourself as a pope. And uh, when Thornley and Hill first started, uh, you know, working with these ideas back, uh, way back when, you know, the the first flush of things came out in the uh, first edition of the Principia Discordia. And basically they set it up like an organized uh, religion, you know, with their (laughs) <laughs> tongues firmly planted in their cheeks and the first editions uh, printed in this uh, 
facsimiles in this uh, latest book, Historia Discordia. But that evolved over time, and around 1969 or so, with the aid, I'm sure, of opening his mind <laughs> through uh, hallucinogens and what all else, Gray Kill came to the uh, realization that uh, everybody should be able to declare themselves popes. Uh, previous to that, you know, uh, they had it set up so only Hill and Thornley could actually uh, – initiate folks into the Discordian Society. Greg Hill saw the folly in that, and so opened up to anybody that anybody, anytime, anywhere could declare themselves a pope. And that, if you've ever seen the uh, pope card, that's exactly what it says. So the philosophy of it kind of changed back then, and so did the direction of the Principia Discordian. That's when he started. Greg Hill was kind of the spearhead. Obviously, Thornley was uh, deeply involved, but during that period is when we started to get a lot of other people involved with the Discordian Society with uh, Robert Anton Wilson and Camden Meneris and Robert Shea and Louise Lacey and a bunch of these people. And uh, through kind of like uh, collaboration of sorts, they uh, came up with subsequent editions of the uh, Principia Discordian. They used, uh, in a way, it was like a, art project, uh, Greg Hill put together these things called groovy packs where he'd fill up a uh, envelope with weird little oddities, maybe some illustration, a poem he wrote, maybe throw a roach from a joint in there and send it through the mail <laughs> to a list of uh, people, different discordian, discordians across the uh, country, and they would add to it, send it to the next person in the list, and the thing would eventually come back to him, and he'd take that material and that's kind of what worked itself into um, subsequent editions of the uh, Principia Discordia, which are way different than the one I have uh, published in the book. And if you haven't you, you haven't seen the fourth edition of the uh, Principia Discordia, you ought to check that out. <laughs> and th that over time became quite an influence on the uh, counterculture, but uh, it was one of those subtle influences that took time uh, to really spread its uh, strange seeds and uh, when uh, you know there was like uh, when that fourth edition came out it was only 500 copies which isn't a whole hell of a lot but uh, you know it became a big influence on things like the Illuminatus trilogy by Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea and the first edition is uh, dedicated to Greg Hill and Kerry Thornley and there's all these references in that uh, Illuminatus to Discordianism. And I read <laughs> I read Illuminatus before I knew anything about Discordianism and it totally went over my head. It's mentioning, you know, the Principia Discordia and Omar Khayyam Ravenhurst, who was Carrie Thornley, <laughs> Malaclips the Younger, who was Greg Hill, and referring to things called the Honest Book of Truth. And you know, I was reading it at the time, it's like it just went over my head. It, I, figures of stuff the authors were making up, but all of it, you know, was kind of based and influenced on by, based on and influenced by uh, Discordianism. And, you know, that's become a huge uh, influence to the uh, counterculture of the, or the Illuminatus. That's how most people get turned on to Robert Anton Wilson. Yeah, I've yet to read it, but it's, it's high on my list of things to get through. I've just, I hear it's, it's a, daunting work but having this background now i guess it'll be a little more cohesive but i you, really you, yeah oh, you, well, you know you know what you need to be prepared for when you read that i would definitely look through my material the prankster and the conspiracy and you know you're looking at a story of discordia now maybe uh find a fourth edition of the principia discordia and maybe <laughs> read cosmic trigger as well, then when you get to Illuminatus, you'll be somewhat prepared because you'll understand a lot of the references. The thing about Illuminatus also that uh, people have difficulty with and what makes it an amazing book is that it's con constantly uh, changing perception from one uh, person to the next, ah, e even like with even within a couple pages all of a sudden it shifts and you're seeing the story through somebody else's eyes. And it, it's not holding you by the hand telling you that. You, 
and once you get used to that, which can be a bit, a bit disert, uh, you know, disconcerting or disorienting, it it uh, you know what if you get a handle on that, then it's a lot easier to read, and it makes it uh, a fascinating experience to be kind of thrown into that world. And in it, they explore. I mean, a lot of that Luminatus came out of. Yeah, the Discordian period, and when Wilson and Shea were working at uh, Playboy as editors there, Wilson uh, was the editor of the Playboy uh, Forum, which uh, basically uh, that that uh, the forum got a lot of uh, letters about civil liberties, so he dealt with that. Yeah. He, was, he was into that, but and he also got the, a lot of letters about these all these crazy conspiracies that were too far out <laughs> to even run them in Playboy. And he, he and Shea used a lot of that material in Illuminatus. Yeah, man, it, all that stuff is pretty dense. And it's funny that it has a bit of an initiation process of its own to get into. But I really love the Pope Hood analysis in the book, the decision that they made to allow anyone to declare themselves a Pope at any time with such a simple doctrine uh, as that, they even, I think it's, I think it's, uh, Robert Anton Wilson's writing or your own writing in, in the book that states that pe- people are going to come out naturally in opposition to such a simple, simple rule as that, such a simple order as <laughs> everyone can declare themselves a Pope, but instead people will naturally inject chaos right away and say, well, you know, you can't declare me a Pope unless I agree to it, or I don't want to be a Pope. Like people will face resistance even to such a simple thing or be naturally skeptical of it because it is such a free handout. You know, people are like, what are you, you're giving me Pope hood? Yeah, I don't want your Pope hood. You know, something's <laughs> up here. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and that just speaks to the underlying philosophy that the universe is based on chaos and the only order is human perception. It's kind of funny that way. Yeah. And uh, you've probably seen the Pope cards. There's some reproduction in the books. It's, uh, once again, you know, sometimes they just send them out to uh, people like they do. They do organize uh, things within the Discordian Society, which really, back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, was never more than, you know, maybe 20 people across the country uh, that <laughs> somehow just got in this letter writing uh, circle. And... Uh, you know, but so at uh, certain times in the uh, course, a lot of them lived close together and they'd get together for parties and such. But, you know, what they'd uh, do, of course, there was Operation Mindfuck, but there was also <laughs> a thing called Jake's where they would target some individual like a, uh, a newspaper editor who maybe wrote something they thought was groovy. And they'd say, oh, we're going to do a Jake on the joint. Uh, July 23rd, uh, send in different letters, and they'd use their stationary, phony uh, Bavarian Illuminati stationary or their Discordian names and just send them a letter welcoming you know, them to the Discordian Society and throw in a few Pope cards, and people would get this and go, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was one of my favorite pranks that I read about in the book because it's some of the names of the groups they had are so funny, and when you see them, you see the letterhead, it looks very official, but you read the words and you're like, what? <laughs> and uh, the idea that a group of people would pick one unsuspecting target and just flood them with those letters is super funny. I mean, some of the names of these various branches that they say are uh, the 12 famous Buddha minds, the brotherhood of the lost of Christ, (laughs) like just (laughs) the society for moral understanding and training, the golden apple Panthers. And these are like fake secret societies or orders that are sending letters to just some unsuspecting person it's well, a, it's a really funny prank. Fake but real. I mean, each of those were different bran- cabals or branches of the Discordian Society that uh, somebody called themselves. So how fake or real were they? Well, that's that's also a good point. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's an interesting point. Um, yeah, man. So tell me about what's the Go Rightly saga here? How did you get interested in these goings on? How did you end up with all this material? Um. Before I was new, well, I'd heard of Discordianism over the years, but it didn't uh, really didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> um, 
but I was more uh, got into it through interest in uh, conspiracy stuff, and uh, namely Kerry Thornley. And I was involved in the zine movement back in the day, you know, what they called the zine revolution, late 80s and 90s, and wrote for a lot of zines. And, uh, yeah. And the uh, main zine back there to find out about other zines was Fact Sheet 5, which there's a great history there with that. It was uh, started by a guy named Mike Gunderloy. And, uh, yeah, sometime in the mid-80s, he started putting out this zine that reviewed all the other zines around. This guy was obsessive. <laughs> He'd review several hundred zines. I don't know if he'd do it, a mu- I think, once a month. he put out Fact Sheet 5. Wow. Really great. So I got turned on to a lot of stuff. And that's where a lot of the cutting edge writing was uh, being done at that time, you know, conspiracies and UFOs, or if you wanted to find out about punk music or whatever, fringy, fringe stuff. And uh, so um, I noticed in Fact Sheet 5, um, occasionally they'd have an article by this guy, Kerry Thornley. Uh, he had a column there called Conspiracy Corner. And uh, I never quite knew what to make of a lot of the stuff he was writing about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but something about it intrigued me. It was kind of interesting. It's like, well, wow, where's this guy coming from? I mean, just obscure theories, uh, conspiracy theories. And then uh, I was into uh, looking into JFK assassination. I noticed probably, in fact, Sheet 5, that he had a 50-page uh, thing uh, that he was sending out uh, called Dreadlock Recollections. Uh, Thornley was uh, made available about uh, his, quote-unquote, involvement in the Kennedy assassination. So I got a hold of that. And I was even more perplexed, you know, because he was talking about things and people involved that I'd never heard about, you know, and I, I was mm-hmm. pretty into it then. So once again, yeah, something intriguing about the fellow, but also didn't quite understand what the hell he was uh, writing about a lot of the time. Then uh, in 91 or 92, there was a book that came out called Conspiracies, Cover-Ups and Crimes by Jonathan Vankin. And in that book, there's several chapters about different uh, conspiracy uh, theories and people in the conspiracy scene. And the first chapter was dedicated to Kerry Thornley. And it talked about how Thornley had known uh, Oswald in the Marines before the Kennedy assassination, how he was writing a book about Oswald you know, three years before the Kennedy assassination. And, and it even went down a deeper rabbit hole that uh, – Thornley suspected that he had been an NK Ultra victim, a, uh, that he and Os- Oswald had been part of a Nazi breeding experiment. Uh, yeah, I thought that this, was pretty out there. <laughs> all this crazy stuff. And it also mentioned you know, other things like uh, Jim Garrison had target, targeted Thornley uh, during his investigation. He believed or claimed that Thornley was a, one of the Oswald doubles, a CIA agent. And in this uh, chapter, it also mentioned the Discordian Society, which once again is like just another thing. There was enough information to process. The <laughs> Discordian <laughs> Society was just another little piece of information. So I dug that chapter in that book, and Vankin, I talked about uh, during that period of uh, maybe writing a full blown biography of uh, Carrie Thornley. <clears throat> which he never got around to doing. And so and I, I was chopping at the bit to read more about the guy. So I started looking into him more, gathering material, got to the point, well, maybe I'll write that book. And um, so that was by the late uh, 90s or so. I was getting more serious around uh, 2000. And at that time, I received a uh, somewhat cryptic email at an email address that uh, – was one a lot of people didn't know, just friends, <clears throat> basically, and uh, family, but it wasn't involved in my, any of my writing or conspiracy stuff. I didn't use it to communicate like that, so it was basically a private email address. Right on. And I received an uh, email from somebody named Robert Newport uh, that uh, stated Greg Hill, the 
founder of Discordianism, had died on July of that year. This was in July 2000. I went, hmm. So I emailed Newport back, who I had no clue who he was. I'd never heard of him. I asked, uh, and I, I was vaguely aware of Break Hill at this time, too, but I knew Discordianism, and I knew Thornley was involved, so I emailed him back and said, did you know Kerry Thornley as well? And uh, Newport emailed me back and said, yeah, I went to uh, high school with both of them. I was one of the founding members of the Discordian Society. I went, oh, that's interesting. So we <laughs> started started course, corresponding, and uh, it turns out he knew uh, – Robert Anton Wilson quite well and a lot of other people. So I jumped into doing the uh, book and arranged an interview with Newport and Robert Anton Wilson at uh, Wilson's place in Santa Cruz. And uh, at that time, Newport, he brought along an armload of materials he was calling the Discordian Archives. And I later used uh, some of that in the uh, Prankster and the Conspiracy book. He let me take it home and I scanned it. Got it back to him and I said, you know, there's a lot of cool uh, stuff here. This might make a good book uh, at some point if you're cool with that. And he gave the thumbs up. He was always cool with it. He Newport was uh, playing around with the idea back then. You know, this is uh, 2000 during that period of putting together a kind of Discordian uh, archives website. But he never got around to it. He got interested in other things, landscape painting <laughs> and uh, so um, so I continued staying in touch with him uh, about doing the project at some point he was always cool with it and then in 2009 he said yeah and the next time you're in LA come down here and I'll give you everything so happened to be going down to LA some business and got together with him and that's when he uh, turned me on to the complete archives which was several boxes of material I think, nice. I, I, yeah, I just figured it was just that armload of stuff that he had tons and tons of stuff, which has led to these projects, you know, the website and the Discordian Archives book, and uh, will lead to a few other projects, as well as a forthcoming book that's uh, coming out in a couple months, Caught in the Crossfire, Kerry Thornley, Oswald, and the Garrison Investigation, because in these archives, yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, Discordian material and other stuff, but uh, there was also a file, and Greg Hill was, these were Greg Hill's archives, by the way, that uh, Newport rescued from probably being dumped into a dumpster when uh, Greg Hill died. Man. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> in the, and within that, of course, was different editions of the Principia Discordia. There was only, which, including the first edition, which everybody thought was lost, but there it was. And uh, as well, there was a lot of the uh, Thornley uh, Garrison investigation materials. And so th those materials are being used for this, uh, this next book I mentioned coming out, Caught in, a cross Caught in the Crossfire. Nice. So that is really cool that you got to meet Robert Anton Wilson. Like, uh, I, I know you had told me that before, but I just w wasn't familiar enough with his work to for that to mean much and uh mm -hmm. now i just think that's super awesome because if there's one person that died in the past like 15 years that i really wish i could have gotten on maybe would have been him i mean i just think he's uh, such a great speaker super interesting can you tell us any about anything about meeting him was it was it fun oh hell yeah um let me before i forget uh one little uh, tidbit about these archives. So when I got them from Newport in 2009, I'd asked him, I think I'd asked him in between 2000 and 2009, how he uh, came to contact me. And he gave me the same answer in 2009 was like, he had no idea yeah. how that all, how that all came about. That's but he knew, uh, he knew, he uh, knew Wilson um, and uh, was kind of involved in a lot of, uh, Wilson's activities in Berkeley uh, during like the uh, early seventies, Wilson would put uh, salons on at his house where they get into, I know you're getting into the eight circuit stuff and uh, yeah. diff uh, 
magic ritual and all this. And Newport was involved in that scene as well. But, uh, yeah, as far as meeting uh, Wilson, a great guy. He was, uh, at that time, he was having problems with uh, post-polio syndrome, which kicked in again, which he'd had issues with over the years. So he had to use a walker to get around, you know. And But that, you know, he didn't let that... Uh, keep him down. He was a big advocate during that uh, period of the uh, use of medical marijuana. <laughs> and there, there was some controversy in, uh, all, all over where they had uh, medical dispensaries in uh, California where the, uh, Bush was president. Then they stepped in. They were going to arrest people uh, picking up their uh, medical marijuana. And no way. Fact, I didn't know they yeah. had dispensaries, but you're talking about the first Bush president, right? Or the second? No, this is the second. Oh, okay. So, so this was around 2005 or so. And you can find, if you look on the net, you can probably find it somewhere. That there's Wilson. He was in a wheelchair at that point, <laughs> picking up his medical marijuana in Santa Cruz, where it was a big public uh, demonstration. So he was always been a big advocate and he was a pothead so <laughs> you can relate to that yep um yep. so yeah he was a very cool dude very uh generous with his time he would uh interact with uh most anybody who approached him it seemed to me you know he tried to avoid crazies obviously yeah any idea how he got so insightful like did he was he a member of Secret societies? Did he? I mean, he definitely studied the material. Oh, he well, he uh, got involved in researching different uh, secret societies and went, you know, like he'd join a branch of the OTO and go through all the rituals and he look in the history of different secret societies. His brain, you know, just uh, worked like that. He was interested. He deeply um, examined the work of Alice Crowley and was really one of the first people to write in a uh, kind of uh, sober manner, <laughs> really looking at Crowley's work, just not jumping on the bandwagon that he was whatever uh, child uh, sacrifice and Satan worshiper, but got deeply into uh, Crowley's writings, which are very dense. And there's a lot going on there that I would never be able to process a lot of hidden codes and word games. And that's the type of stuff that uh, Wilson was very good on picking uh, up on stuff like that and decoding them. He was a big, a huge fan of Finnegan's Wake by Uly or, and Ulysses by uh, Joyce. Yes. Which are just riddled with all of that kind of stuff that the average intellect such as mine, you know, <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> grasp any of it. But, uh, you know, uh, Wilson was all over stuff like that. So, you know, very... Uh, intelligent guy and he uh, embraced the counterculture you know was influenced by people like buckminster fuller and timothy leary mm -hmm. as well he was very tight with uh, timothy leary and they basically worked up you know the uh, eight circuit uh, model concept and things like that yeah, I would, it's that's dense material, but I'd advise anyone to look into it. The Eight Circuits of Human Consciousness. It's a pretty good breakdown of the way people act and the way people think and why people turn out the way they do. They've got a lot of interesting information there. But, man, as far as Discordianism, I think a lot of the pranks they pulled are pretty awesome. And I know on one hand... They sort of blew up a lot of outrageous conspiracy theories and carried out a lot of hoaxes, which could be considered a big nuisance for truth seekers. But yeah, I think that these guys kind of had like a George Carlin energy or even a Hunter S. Thompson or like you said, a Crowley energy and that they all like to fuck with the seriousness of the power structure and that just by taking the system seriously and respecting the politicians and traditions that gives them power. So fuck all that. Let's spread some rumors and let's let this place tear itself apart. Is that the vibe you get? Yeah, part of that uh, Operation Mindfuck came out of the Garrison investigation. And so I probably need to mention that a bit because uh, Thornley got uh, targeted by Garrison in his investigation. Garrison claimed that, uh, I'd mentioned before, he claimed uh, Thornley was a CIA operative, mm -hmm. possibly one of the 
Oswald doubles, on and on, all this uh, stuff. Garrison had a bunch of uh, investigators. He had, you know, a couple of investigators on his staff, but he had all these freelance investigators show up in New Orleans, and uh, some of them latched on to some pretty wild uh, theories. And so uh, Garrison was getting fed this stuff from all directions, and one of the wilder theories was presented to Garrison from a dude, by a dude named uh, Alan Chapman, who claimed that the uh, Bavarian Illuminati was behind the assassination. And so yeah. Thornley caught wind of this, and uh, Will, Robert Anton Wilson, they were friends too, he was looking at Thornley's situation as well and thought he was getting uh, screwed around. And so they, you know, they thought, well... You know, screw this. They're claiming <laughs> the uh, Bavarian Illuminati's uh, involved in the assassination, and I'm involved in it. So maybe I'll go ahead and claim I'm a, a member of the Bavarian Illuminati. And that's when they worked up that Bavarian Illuminati letterheads, and they'd send off letters, uh, you know, to garrison such people claiming, yes, I admit, I'm, and he'd use his uh, discordian name, Omar Khayyam Ravenhurst. Or if Wilson was writing, his uh, handle was uh, Mordecai the Foul. <laughs> and they'd write in saying, yes, we are the uh, Illuminati, but we've uh, actually come here to illuminate you, not uh, <laughs> oppress you. Those type of uh, stuff. So uh forgot what we were, where we were going, but that kind of got the, uh, a lot of those Operation Mindfuck <laughs> OM activities going back in the day. Yeah, and... Hey, man, thank God we got removed from Dark Matter Radio because otherwise I don't know how we could talk about Operation Mindfuck because <laughs> we were taken out yeah. for using such foul language as that. Yeah, I had a interesting uh, experience with uh, Dark Matter Radio. Yeah? Care to yeah, share? Nothing, nothing bad about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, this happened just uh, the other night. I Recently I was on... Uh, Jimmy Church's show, I'm familiar yeah, with yeah. his. Uh, he's pretty cool. He does a real good uh, show, actually, on their uh, network. And uh, apparently, he's uh, warming the seat or holding the place of Art Bell, who's supposedly going to come back at uh, some time. And maybe what I'm talking about, I'll do a uh, post for uh, higher side chats about this because they, there was a guest on the other night by the name of uh, Solaris Blue Raven. I've heard of her. Yeah, and she's the one who claims uh, in a mind control victim and the group rushes behind it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there was some weird audio interference that started when uh, she said DARPA. And I had wow. happened to be recording that because uh, I was watching my beloved uh, San Francisco Giants uh, play. And so I wanted to listen to the interview later. And they couldn't hear it there at the... Uh, station when they were conducting the interview, but I happened to uh, catch the audio of that, and for sure I'll share this on a post on the Higher Side chat. Right so it's, it's, it was a pretty uh, curious incident. So, yeah, maybe that's just a good way to uh, promote the upcoming post at <laughs> Higher Side Chats, which I'll get to here shortly. Right on. But, but talking about Wilson, I wanted to share, if I can find it, have you read the uh, Cosmic Trigger? I haven't, except for the there's a couple excerpts in your book from Cosmic Trigger that definitely got me jazzed up about getting into it. Um, this is from, uh, I'm just reading one paragraph. This was the uh, preface to the new edition. Anyway, this sums up a lot in a short paragraph about Wilson's worldview. It says, my own opinion is that belief is the death of intelligence. As soon as one believes a doctrine of any sort or assumes certitude, one stops thinking about that aspect of existence. The more certitude one assumes, the less there is left to think about. And a person sure of everything would never have any need to think about anything and might be considered clinically dead under current medical standards where the absence of brain activity is taken to mean that life is ended. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's smart. I totally agree with that. That's a big, you know, I couldn't art have articulated it in that 
that well, but when I was growing up in a Catholic school, that's how I felt in that private school. I'm just like, how does everybody know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's intriguing, man. He, he was right on. And uh, or, or to turn that around a bit, you know, in the conspiracy culture as well, people who <laughs> yes. claim ultimate certitude about things religion or conspiracies or ufos uh you know and it's very lucky for me that there's so many people out there that are so sure because those are the guests that i generally have but yeah i always try to maintain a pretty neutral position of yeah that's a that you know someone can talk for two hours and be like that's a great possibility <laughs> you know that's a and that's a, all you can ever say like that's an interesting possibility that might be true but you can never be a hundred percent, especially when you're talking about conspiracy materials where experts are trying to keep it from you, but yet you're absolutely certain, you know, it's, it just doesn't really work that way. But of course, if we all thought like that, then you might have a pretty boring show. So it's good (laughs) to have the true believers. Yeah, you got to, otherwise it'd just be a bunch of, I don't know, man. (laughs) But, uh, it's weird, it's weird, but yeah. Uh, another, you talked about them influencing the counterculture and it's hard to know what is a joke and what is a real you know thing that they're talking about and that's obviously part of the genius of it but they at least claimed ownership for the peace sign for the v because v is of course the roman numeral for five and in discordianism five is one of the magic numbers there Mm -hmm. so that's funny that they actually have a basis for saying that oh yeah we were the ones that started going around throwing up the v and now, is that just a convenient, convenient little anecdote that gives them uh, an excuse to say so, or is that the legitimate answer? It's impossible to know, but it is funny. I don't know. They seem to be using it uh, pretty early on, and uh, yeah, it signifies also the law of fives. There's two, you know, the two fingers up and the three down. Mm-hmm. Two plus <laughs> three is the law of fives, which is big in the Scordianism. So. No, I don't know. <laughs> and another thought thing that I really liked, because I'm all into, um, I'm very anti-capitalistic. I would love to just burn the system down. I like things like the Venus Project and resource-based economy ideas and zeitgeist. And they actually had a little thing they were circulating for a while, the purse and the puts movements. I don't know if you remember what those anagrams stand for, but those were pretty awesome. I, did, I was wondering if they ever really got any legs. I think uh, they just... Floated that stuff out there, you know, to <laughs> just to see what would stick. That was one of the things they threw out. Yeah, and to uh, as discussion points about uh, I forget what some of the acronyms are. Oh well, for for I wrote them down for because uh, I knew I wasn't going to remember. But yeah. uh, purse was permanent universal rent strike exchange, and putts was permanent universal tax zap. And they're just yeah. basically like, don't pay your taxes <laughs> and don't pay your rent uh, because we came up with some anagrams that sound cool yeah that and well you know they were into anarchist uh libertarian and libertarian back you know uh, thornley was the editor of a libertarian uh, newsletter a cutting edge one back uh in the mid 60s and where they were coming from back then is a hell of a lot different than libertarianism is today and he, he was leaning more towards anarcho libertarianism and so that's how he and uh, Robert Anton Wilson hooked up originally. Uh, this corresponding because they were both editing a magazine and became aware of he- the stuff each other was writing about. One thing that uh, started the conversation was about a guy named uh, anarchist named Leander Spooner who started the first private uh, mail delivery system, non-government. Uh, huh mail delivery that actually did better than uh, the federal system and made a profit and all this, but the feds, whatever, for whatever reason, didn't like that and shut them down. But they got interested in these thoughts and like groups that would create their own monetary uh, currency and all that. And you'll see the, uh, the Scordians came up with their own monetary system, alternate currency called flax notes. And uh, they even play with these ideas in the Illuminatus trilogy. And part of it was inspired by uh, Emperor Norton in San Francisco, kind of crazy, brilliant, homeless uh, dude in San Francisco who uh, way back in the 1800s came up with his own, uh, uh, own what do you call him, uh, 
uh, Norton notes or whatever yeah, else, yeah. Or form of Curtis uh, currency. So the Discordians, different Discordians came up with their own uh, flax notes, which uh, also are uh, see in the uh, story of Discordia book. So they're into all these anarcho libertarian type of uh, thinking, you know? Yeah. That's, that's funny about the post office thing. I actually had an idea a few years ago when I was stuck at the DMV because I hate it so much, you know, talking Ooh. about organizations that could oh. be privatized and made better than the, the way the government does it. The worst. Um, <laughs> how cool would it be if there was a place where they, it was a private company, they had all the certifications and authority to do all the things you need to do at a DMV, but it was... Um, you could call it the DMB, and it'd be like a bar. So you could sit in the bar, <laughs> you could have a couple beers, watch the TV, they'll call your number, they'll take your picture for your license, you'll do your registration. But uh, I thought that would be so ironic to make it a bar. Of course, you're not going to do driver's tests or you know let drunk people do it, but uh, why can't it just be an enjoyable experience to wait around and, and take care of some shit? Why does it have to be god-awful, miserable, uh, it's because there's just no in- there's no competition. There's no incentive mm-hmm. to make it good because you have to deal with them. You'll go to jail if you don't. Yeah, but they could even set up set up a uh, with this idea of yours DMB simulated driving. You know, yeah. and you would take the uh, chance you could you know blow to see what your alcohol level. You sure you want to take the simulated test? Ah, <laughs> go ahead. You know, they, they give you a few chances too. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I, I think mean, that's I- a great idea. Yeah, the DMB is oh god. It's- <laughs> It's the it, worst. Yeah, I agree. Because pe- people are just standing there. You're all agitated, and the person in front of you is pissed off, and then you're stressed out. You got to take the test, and blah 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 blah. Yeah, and you know we were talking about the kind of the the prankster energy of these guys of discordianism in general. And the only person I can think of, I mentioned him earlier, but the only other person I can think of who has that type of energy was Hunter S. Thompson. You know, he used to make up stories <laughs> about mm-hmm. politicians and circulate them and just say, fuck it. I don't care if it's true. I just want people, I just want it to infect the culture. And I yeah. was wondering, did you ever see or hear about any link between Hunter S. Thompson, Gonzo journalism and the discordian guys? Cause they're definitely philosophically aligned. No, and you know the Discordians were obviously less lesser known than uh, Thompson. You know he was a pretty big name by that period. And uh, so, but yeah, I can see some parallels there. Like uh, Thompson's story that he floated that um, who was it? Muskie, who was the uh, I guess he was a presidential candidate. Mm-hmm. At that time, 72 election that he was mainlining Ibogaine, and that would explain why he had these different uh, irrational outbursts and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. he, he just put it out there, you know. It was like <laughs> it's, well, I mean, I understand the angle. Like today, we just call that like disinformation. Today, it's like a big problem in the conspiracy world. A lot of paid shills and all that stuff. People are really. Mm-hmm concerned about that and i i do get that but i also have a real natural appreciation for better or worse for that trickster energy like i just appreciate it i like all those guys who've ever like taken that kind of up i mean Mm -hmm. it it, it, just in my private life it's always funny to watch someone take a few too many mushrooms or see the panic in someone's eyes when they have their belief system challenged Mm -hmm. or their ego melted it's something people should enjoy and kind of have a sense of humor about and that's what these kind of people were all about yeah man you gotta keep that uh perspective or you'll go uh crazy you know (laughs) well here's the other thing that's suspect is you know, Greg Hill, he worked for the Bank of America for 23 years. Carrie Thornley wrote a book about Oswald pre Kennedy assassination. That's a little close to the conspiracy. I mean, Timothy <laughs> Leary and Terrence McKenna are both suspected of being CIA assets. That's coming up more and more in the stuff that I'm looking into. And it, it makes you wonder if these people were just doing this out of an enjoyment for it or if they had some nefarious ulterior motives. <laughs> I don't think so. I think uh, Thornley got pretty deep into certain things, and it appears that uh, Thornley and Oswald might have been, indeed, might have been MK Ultra victims. They both served in uh, Japan at Atsugi uh, Base, 
which was where all that stuff was going on with, you know, they were testing LSD on uh, different soldiers and stuff there. Right. Oddly enough, uh, the two big storage facilities for LSD during that period by the CIA were the two bases that uh, Thornley happened to uh, be stationed at. Wow. And so there's a lot of evidence, uh, and I share this in the uh, latest new book that will be coming out, that, yeah, uh, Thornley and Oswald were both manipulated by these type of uh, programs. As far as, you know, these uh, things coming out about McKenna and Leary, uh, the uh, McKenna thing, I don't put a lot of uh, credence into uh, Leary. I mean, a lot of, they, know, they knew where the LSD was coming from. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, hey, figured they'd take it and use it to their own ends. Now, <laughs> at one point, uh, Leary, uh, basically, he was given the... Uh, option of ratting on some people or <laughs> getting uh, put away for a long, long time. And it appears that, uh, he, you know, he uh, actually did cooperate with the government. So this is another thing where people point their uh, fingers, but I don't necessarily see. You know. Right. And it, it's easy to judge people who are under the thumb of the FBI or the CIA. It's easy to be like, oh, you know, you turned on the movement. I don't know. It just yeah. seems like he was in a tough position, but, uh, yeah. And, and we still don't know all the details about that. It's really not clear how much of that he did, you know, but he was, Larry I'm talking about, was definitely pressured by the uh, government mm-hmm. and, and, I- and persecuted, you know, for freedom of thought. You know, he's much like Wilhelm Reich and these type of uh, – Guys, because we're talking for Larry, it was only a couple of joints <laughs> that probably weren't even his. <laughs> yeah, and I actually listened to a Q&A with Robert Anton Wilson where someone asked his thoughts on Timothy Leary. Was T- Timothy Leary working with the government? And he basically said that he thought that Timothy Leary was being harassed for a long, long, long time and that they tried to extract information from him often And it seems clear by the results that he never gave them enough information to be happy. So he obviously was reluctant with what he was giving them. And they eventually locked him in jail. Like, it's hard to say that person's cooperating. They're Mm -hmm. in jail, for Christ's sake. Yeah, yeah. But everybody's everybody's got a theory and everybody's distrustful of this guy or that guy. And I'm a big McKenna fan. I like what he's saying. And I guess I can understand the perspective that... His whole approach was a peaceful, nonviolent approach, which from the elite's perspective, if you can just keep everybody doing some drugs and singing Kumbaya and just complaining and not raising arms, then yeah, that could be uh, have an effect of sedating the masses or at least that counterculture. I guess I could see that perspective, but he seems like a genuine guy. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I don't discount uh, a lot of those uh, theories, but uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> I, you know, as far as some of these characters, I uh, may Russell claim that uh, she made a bunch of claims about uh, <laughs> Robert Anton Wilson and Timothy Leary, and they had written. I have some old articles where they were talking about uh, ways to reprogram yourself and my different mind control and this type of stuff and neuro linguistic programming kind of stuff. Yeah. And may Russell uh, latched onto that. And she claimed that, uh, Leary and Wilson were this mind control tag team that like showed up for instance with, uh, Larry Flint. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Founder of hustler magazine, you know, his whole, uh, story Mm -hmm. that they were sent in to uh, brainwash him and all, all this far out (laughs) stuff. And I I have a letter in from conspiracy uh, journal from like 1977 where Wilson addressed me Russell's claim. And he admitted, yeah, that he was a diabolical (laughs) CIA agent receiving gold bricks from uh, Rockefeller that were delivered each month. (laughs) (laughs) I met with the guy. Yeah. A lot of these people, if they were well-paid, placed uh, uh, agents of Rockefeller or whoever, they uh, didn't live that lavish lifestyle, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Well, man, I mean, we're getting kind of down to it. Is there an aspect of Discordianism that resonates with you that we haven't touched on or glossed over? Uh, no, I think we've touched on it all. Just kind of that philosophy of the prankster, trickster used to uh, illuminate or possibly get to uh, certain truths that you can't get to without uh, taking a kind of humorous approach. Yeah. Um, and uh, what else? Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's been interesting, my life uh, being a quote-unquote discordian uh, these different book projects, they've just been littered with synchronicities. So there, there's a magical component there that, uh, you know, uh, and how, how does that happen? Who is, uh, who is the master that makes the grass green? Perhaps we uh, create our own reality. <laughs> but uh, since I've tapped into this web of Discordianism, uh, I've met a lot of cool people and have, you know, I continually get uh, people contacting me and laying new stuff on me. So I, it's, I've kind of become the focal point of uh, channeling, continually channel this uh, information, a lot of this, this old material that people have never really seen to get it out there so people have a better idea of really what, how, how Discordianism all came about. Yeah, I think it's awesome. I, I think it's awesome that you're doing that. I appreciate you sending me a copy of the book. I mean, the stuff you've scanned in is really cool to see, and it's always a pleasure to hang out with you a bit, man. Um, we got ParanoiaCon coming up the first weekend of August. Are you going to lay some more psychedelic serenading on the unsuspecting attendees again this <laughs> year or no? I don't think I'm going to be able to make it this year, but wow. it'll, be a, it'll be a game time decision. I hear it's only just a one-day deal this year. That right? that's news to me, but you know how news of these events happen. I thought it was a two day. No, I think it's been uh, stripped down a bit to one day. Uh, <laughs> last I <laughs> talked to Ron, unless he changed again, it's going to focus on uh, mind control and the counterculture, that type of stuff we were talking about. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, man, it, it was fun last time, but. Um, well, you know, if you're not going to make it there, is there anything uh, else you want to tell the people about any other projects or where they can contact you and interrupt all your hard work? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> definitely check out, if they're interested in this Discordian stuff, to check out the website, which is historiadiscordia.com. And, uh, yeah, I can be contacted through there or I'm not hard to find. Right. Uh, that's the main thing. Then, yeah, obviously promote this Astoria Discordia book. That's why we're talking today. And also the forthcoming book, Caught in the Crossfire. Awesome, man. Well, who knows where Discordianism would be today without you breathing new life into it and doing the work to archive these things online and bring them into the digital age. It's definitely a respectful tribute. So I appreciate it, man. Take care of yourself and hail Eris. All hail Discordia. <laughs> <laughs>